higher tonight, falling to lows of 9 to 11 degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. Well, hello there. You're very welcome along to Monday evenings Off the Ball. Coming up this hour, we will have historian Brian Hanley and Michael Foley of the Sunday Times with us talking about John Mitchell. So he is a nationalist icon in Ireland in many ways across the 19th century. GEA clubs around the country took up his name, but there is a less savoury side to Mitchell, a racist side, frankly, to Mitchell. We'll talk about that this hour. The world, obviously, is very much focused on this issue at the moment, and it affects the GEA as well in a fairly significant way. So we'll talk about that this hour. Eight o'clock, Monday Night Rugby, we have Stuart Barnes with us, a free thinker, brilliant broadcaster, brilliant journalist, writer, a player with Bath in their halcyon days, often a frustrated onlooker with England as Rob Andrew took the number 10 jersey and he sat on the bench and watched. So Stuart Barnes joins us to reflect on his life and times post eight o'clock. And then after nine, Pat Nevin with us. Football's back this week. We'll bring you commentary, by the way, of Arsenal, Manchester City on Wednesday. So Pat Nevin with us this Monday as well. 53106 is the text number. We're at off the ball. Richie McCormick, hello to you. How are you, Joe? You well? Very well. Ronan Mullen, good evening. Joe, how are things? Very well. I was uh, tickled. I think we all were in some ways. If you're on Twitter today, you will have seen the videos of the general election debates. Leo Varadkar said that putting Micheál Martin back in charge of the country would be the same as putting John Delaney in charge of the FAI again. Now, I'm sure you saw the new role has been advertised. Salary is a measly 207,000. I'm not sure if rent is paid or not. But either way, this being a strange year, maybe, I mean, just maybe, Richie, it's time to put John Delaney back in charge, give him another go and steer Irish football <laughs> black to glory. And I'm just putting it out there. Just me? Just me? I'm just putting people that out People learn there. from the mistakes, Joe. People learn from the mistakes. They do. And, and I believe there's enough mistakes to be learned from uh, at this juncture. So who knows, possibly. Uh, but yeah, 200 and odd thousand euro. It's still, for a talk of um, tightening of, of belts and all that kind of stuff at the FAI, it's still a hell of a chunk of change for somebody to be walking away with. It's a very nice living with some nice perks thrown in. So mm. that's been advertised. There's a new group looking after finding surely the some right awkward person conversations to take the this job. Week. It's surely some awkward conversations this week regarding you know financial packages with League of Ireland clubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I know it's not the three hundred and sixty thousand that it was, but two hundred and seven thousand or whatever it is. And um, when you're going to League of Ireland clubs and asking them to give up their European money, I'm sure they have right to look back at, across the table and say. Listen, uh, this purse tightening needs to go on across the board here. It's difficult to know, is this the best time to get this role when, uh, you know, the only way is up, to be fair. Mm. And then on the flip side of things, it's going to be the most scrutinised administration position in the history of Irish sport for the next few years, given what went before. So it's whoever takes over is a big job on their hands. Just keep, you know the who head, got just, keep, just keep the head down would be tip number one. Yeah. Have a look Do over at, at the Philip Brown type approach to sports administration. Keep the head down. So Life magazine, I'm sorry, I'm not going to your rooftop party. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Delete Barry Egan's number at all costs. Oh, well, hang on. That's not what it is. Let's not go too far. Let's not go too far. <laughs> so um, a few bits and bobs on the show, obviously. Stuart Barnes on the way, he's great. I mean, I've always really loved his co-commentary and he's been on the show several times over the last number of years. So we decided to ask him on and chat to him about his career on and off the pitch. That is on the way at 8 o'clock. Lots of good stuff in that, I promise you. Uh, this hour, I mentioned the John Mitchell discussion. So uh, Mark Gallagher, as is his general habit, had a brilliant piece over the weekend on this situation. Uh, Ronan, you're aware of this because we chatted earlier on in the show programme meeting to put the show together, so you're up to speed. Richie, if you're not, mm. John Mitchell, there are about 1,600 GA clubs across the country, certainly around 10 of them anyway are named in honour of John Mitchell. He's, you know, Castlebar Mitchells, uh, Tralee, I think. So right at right, there are about 10 clubs around the country. Mitchell uh, in his day in the 19th century was a big icon of the nationalist movement. He set up the United Irishman newspaper. He uh, tried to further the nationalist cause. And so he was a household name. He was a big celebrity in the 1840s, 1850s. So when GAA clubs came into existence, naturally many of them looked to nationalist as leaders, as, as, as a namesakes for the club, and numerous clubs picked Mitchell. It was, it was, however, when he went to the States, and I'm sure my, you know, this was not widely known around the country, but he went to the States, and um, while there, Mitchell championed the rights of slave owners. He described African Americans, although he didn't use that term, as innately inferior people in his justification for slavery. 
He denied slavery was a crime or wrong. He wanted to make American people, he said, uh, proud and fond of slavery. I wanted to make it a national institution. Civil war happened. He was very much on the Confederate side and was even extreme in his views by Confederate standards. And ultimately, obviously, the war didn't go his way. And he came home to Ireland, was elected to Parliament briefly, and then died shortly thereafter. So it's that second half to Mitchell's life, which is probably less known here, and certainly, I suspect, strongly suspect, wasn't known by those who uh, named GA clubs after him. But given where the world is at now, it's a discussion that probably needs to be had if we are, as Brian Handley said in Mark Geller's piece, and we'll have Brian Handley on later on, he, he makes the point, we have to have a discussion about this. There may be people playing for these clubs today, and this is a more diverse society in this country than ever. There may be players playing for these clubs today, children playing for these clubs today, and 150 years ago, the name of the club, the, the Mitchell, uh, would have described them as innately inferior. And so that is an uncomfortable truth for the GAA to face. It's part of the wider discussion, obviously. And we'll chat about it. We're not looking to start some kind of culture war or uh, victimise any clubs or say anything about the members of those clubs. I really want to emphasise that. But it's a discussion worth having. And we'll do it very calmly and very fairly, I hope, with Brian Hanley, who's a historian, assistant professor of history at Trinity, and Michael Foley of the Sunday Times as well. So that's on the way this hour. Pretty good show, all told. Richie, let's kick off the news round. Where are we starting? Uh, we'll start with uh, matters close to home. A scheduled meeting between the FAI and the SSE or Tristy League clubs has been postponed until Wednesday. It's believed that four European clubs qualified were again asked to share part of their UEFA prize money with the rest. One of those clubs, Derry City, has expressed its scepticism at the FAI's financial package that is currently on offer. And off the balls learned that four League of Ireland players have applied to the FIFA fund for players, which was set up for players claiming unpaid wages from clubs. A total of 441 players worldwide have made applications with 89% of those coming from Europe. Over two and a half million euro has been set aside for uh, players left out of pocket due to the coronavirus pandemic. As an addendum to that, by the way, I mentioned talks there. Uh, a statement on behalf of the First Division clubs, the League of Ireland has just been released actually in the past five minutes or so. Uh, they say the First Division clubs held a very positive meeting with Gary Owens and Noel Quinn from the FAI this afternoon. The engagement was open, honest and focused on achieving a solution that will be fair for all clubs whilst continually focusing on trying to get back to playing football. As a group of clubs, we're increasingly positive about the possibility of returning to competitive action, hopefully in August. Of course, some sacrifices will need to be made by everyone involved in the League of Ireland, but our collective aim has been to return to playing while ensuring our club clubs remain viable community entities. We're also optimistic that a solution can be found to enable our underage women's team to also uh, return to league action. We're particularly mindful that youth and women's league teams across the country are returning to training this week and recognise the need to develop viable solutions for the season ahead. That statement from First Division Clubs just released in the past five minutes. Richie, we have a date for the Champions League final. Seemingly, yeah, Lisbon is poised, poised to host this year's final of the Champions League on August the 23rd. The Portuguese capital will be home to the tournament from the quarter final stage onwards. Istanbul's Ataturk Stadium is due to host this year's decider, but will do so instead next year with the calendar for finals pushed back a year. So St. Petersburg is now going to be in 2022. Uh, the Europa League will follow a similar format with the quarter finals onwards being played in Germany, namely the cities of Duisburg, Gelsenkirchen, Frankfurt, and Cologne. UEFA's executive committee is due to ratify these proposals on Wednesday. So you say the Portuguese capital, Lisbon, will be home to the tournament from the quarter-final stage onwards. That means every yeah. game, every Champions League game happens in Lisbon now. Yes. Um, bar the, there are two outstanding second legs for the last 16, the ones in uh, involving Juventus and Barcelona. Those games are going to be played in their host city. Uh, the remaining ties in the last 16 from there onwards are going to be played in uh, in Lisbon. Yeah. And then from the quarterfinals, everything is going to be in, in Lisbon onwards. And do we know, are these two-legged quarterfinals with home and away goals? They had talked about doing one-legged semifinals and judging by the calendar that they have in place, I would though I would think that they are going to be um, one-legged games. But a final ratification from UEFA is due to come. But the idea of a kind of a, a straight knockout World Cup edition has been something that had been kicked around and that they would be just playing one-legged quarterfinals um, after getting the two-legged last 16 ties out of the way. Interesting. Ronan Mullen, thoughts? One-legged quarterfinals, semifinals? Yeah, I think at this point it's just a matter of, of getting it finished. It really isn't it. It's, it's not going to be satisfactory... I don't think anyone's going to be totally uh, pleased with how the whole thing plays out, but just in terms of moving forward, I think they just have to get it done. And there will be a nice 
novelty to a sort of a tournament feel, uh, a summer tournament feel rather, where the thing is sort of rattled off. And mm. while it might be a unique Champions League winner, at least we'll have a winner and can sort of plan forward for the next tournaments. Jason Sherlock talking last night, Rich. He was, yeah, and he says that more work needs to be done to ensure the GEA is an inclusive and diverse community. The All Ireland winner with Dublin told the Sunday game that he encountered racism throughout his career. He says he internalised a lot of it early on, and Sherlock says it's down to everyone at matches, not just referees or officials, to police the issue. He'd also like to see uh, racism form part of the GEA's coaching regimen. Golf last night, we had live golf back, PGA Tour was back. Rory McIlroy, he went into the day three shots off the lead, he never featured. Yeah. It's nice to know that some things haven't changed uh, as regards the three-month break from sport. World number one, Rory McIlroy says he got stuck in a rut as he failed to fire in the final round of the Charles Schwab Challenge in Fort Worth. The number one in the world finished down the field in a share of 32nd on six under par last night. Daniel Berger got the better of Colin Morikawa in a playoff to take the first PGA Tour event upon the Tour's resumption. It was... Uh, so I was watching this guy across a few nights I was curious to see what it would be like apparently Colonial anyway you don't see much of the fans uh, in comparison with other courses because they're tucked away under trees at Colonial but I, you didn't miss them until maybe last night in the final hour of the play because it was actually a stupendously exciting finish you know under other, under mm. other, other circumstances went to a playoff and there were it was a bunch leaderboard could have been three or four very viable winners and then it went to a playoff and it was in the midst of that finish and the playoff that the lack of crowd suddenly did feel a little bit jarring and there was the element of a tree falling in the woods and no one being there to see it. But in the main, certainly in the early part of the week, it made very little difference. In fact, I'd say a lot of people did not miss, you know, made a point of not missing the mashed potato brigade. So that's golf. They're all going to, by the way, they, they, this was a stacked field and it's going to continue for the next few weeks if you're into your golf. McElroy and all the others are going to play next week as well at, at um, Hilton Head. So there should be some good golf over the coming weeks. Now, and as if, yeah. if you're into your, if you're into your golf, I should mention that as of today, Lee Carvalho's putting challenge of Simpsons fame is now a yes. real game, which is available online. So if anyone wants to scratch that golf itch, that is obviously the greatest golf game ever made. So get all over that. All the hype about Rory from OTB fawning fanboys came to nothing. But McGinley was right. Rory should focus on golf and not meaningless gestures. Says one texture. I think Rory's got his fair share of criticism here as well. Although, how could you not be a fan of Rory, really? I mean, he's world number one. He does have an issue on Sunday, arguably. But uh, I don't agree with the Paul McGinley line on Rory should focus on golf and not meaningless gestures. I think plenty have managed to do both. A lot of GEA clubs are named after religious people. That's OK, as clerical abuse is accepted and tolerated in this country, says another texture. I knew this would be a contentious issue. There's going to be a degree of what about her here. And I, I, I understand that. So there's going to be a degree of, well, if, you, if we do this, then we have to do X, Y, and Z. Let's just talk about John Mitchell in this instance, because I don't think we can have broad, sweeping, hard and fast rules. Let's go individual cases, talk about them. Let the clubs themselves talk about it. Let the clubs themselves decide. Because I mean, otherwise, the, the what about it here will just go out of control. Um, so let's, let's stick but to Joe, Mitchell. But let's Joe, stick to Mitchell. Joe. But Joe, I heard Pori Pierce ate meat on Fridays. How dare they have clubs named after him? Where does this end, Joe? Where does this end, indeed? Yeah. Well, it's it's not going any further than John Mitchell today. Let's discuss John okay, Mitchell. Let's deal with that. And don't hit me with the. But where do we go next? What's this going to mean? That do do we have to tear down every statue? I'm not getting. That sounds into way it. too sensible. Yeah. So. Where are we going? Oh well, Marcus Rashford then. So Downing Street have responded to Marcus Rashford. I know Richie. <laughs> They have, and not favourably. Uh, Marcus Rashford says he won't give up in his attempt to force a British government U-turn regarding its free school meals voucher system for low-income families over the summer holiday period over there. The Manchester United Forum penned an open letter to all MPs in the British Parliament regarding the issue. Rashford has helped raise over €20 million Euro for charity during the course of football's hiatus. However, Downing Street's confirmed that the scheme will be ending when the school term ends. Rashford explained that his upbringing informed his stance. My mum was a, a single parent. She's got five kids that was all living in the same house. Um, and that, that moment was the, the most difficult moment. Um, and not only, so she's working, she's working very hard to, to put food on the table. And then it's the stress on, her, on, on the shoulders that, that affected her after we've ate our dinner. Um, Cause she knows she's, she's worrying about the situation. She's trying to go to sleep, but she can't because she's so worried. And then the next day, eight o'clock, she gets up, 
uh, gets on the bus and starts the day again. And this was every single day on her to, to try and feed five five kids. And, you know, she was part of, of programmes like that, that, um, you know, like food vouchers and stuff like that. And, and they used to help her along the way of, of um, trying to help take care of her family. And, you know, once I think my eldest sister, my eldest brother moved out, I seen it got a little bit easier on her. She started doing, you know, things that would be considered normal things again, like um, maybe going going to a friend's houses and, and stuff like that. Um, but before that, she'd never do anything. She was literally working, trying to sleep, working, trying to sleep. And that was sort of her routine. So uh, Downing Street got back and made the point that they've pledged an extra 63 million to help feed families via local authorities. Uh, Rashford is saying we need to extend the free school policy across the summer. There's so many low-income families, they're going to suffer unduly and the policy helped him out when he was young. Where this gets very interesting, I suppose, Ronan, in the current climate, there's no doubt things are very charged. We're going to see Black Lives logos and, and the a name in, in place of players' names on the back of their jerseys for the first 12 matches in the Premier League. FIFA have said players are not to be censured for protesting. The Bundesliga hasn't punished players. The Premier League is not going to punish players. We saw Marcelo last night for Real Madrid take a knee. There is a reason football, the Premier League and FIFA, have tried to just ban all political statements because they know that very quickly things adapt, there is the next statement, and then there's another cause and another cause, and it gets very, very difficult for them to rule on what's allowed and not allowed. So, for instance, if Marcus Rashford decides to protest over the food bank policy, because you're, you're allowed now, it seems, in the Premier League in the short term, lift up your jersey if you score a goal and make a Black Lives Matter a statement of some kind on a shirt underneath. So, what if Rashford lifts up, lifts up his jersey and says, extend the food banks, Tories don't care about children, whatever. You know, the, well, p pick your your uh, your your, your uh, wording. Then, you know, that that gets very tricky. As in, well, like, surely feeding underprivileged children can't be considered too controversial. If we're allowed Black Lives Matter, then surely I'm allowed to promote this cause. And what do the Premier League do then? I think it's going to be uh, an exceptionally fascinating couple of weeks coming up in English football. Ronan, I'm not quite sure how it's going to go. And the thing is, the Premier League went into this with their eyes open. Their hand has been forced. The NFL's hand has been forced. MLS's hand has been forced. They, they know the dangers, but there's just such a, a strength of feeling that they can't do anything but go along with it. Yeah, and we know it's not the first time that sport and social issues have been entwined, but this does feel somewhat unprecedented just to those points. And uh, we spoke about it in previous weeks that the social media age has almost empowered athletes further. They seem more socially attuned than, than previous generations could be just because they have that vehicle to get their message out there, which might have uh, gone elsewhere in, in previous years. But just getting onto the pitch is almost... To put any framework on it from the administrator's point of view, I think would be setting a dangerous precedent. I think they need to see how this plays out and give the players their opportunity because they're obviously coming back, making their own sacrifice by playing these games. And you see it in America, which is still sort of where this is rooted, the, the main epicentre of the protests. The NBA, which seemed by all accounts to be all set for a comeback in the last couple of days, some um, players have sort of aired concerns that they feel that coming back at this time will take um, attention away from the key messaging that these players are trying to get out there off the court. So just they think that the NBA coming back is a convenient distraction for society almost, the likes of Kyrie Irving. And Dwight Howard has come out today and said something similar. So the players, he, he, by coming back, they might be more inclined to make use of this platform. And I, I, do, I do think that is likely to be an issue. So from the FA's point of view, the Premier League's point of view, they're just going to have to roll with the punches a little bit and, and see how it goes. Rich, where are we going next? Uh, sportswear manufacturers Umbro have distanced themselves from Linfield's new away kit. The purple and orange kit shares its colours with the loyalist paramilitary group, the UVF. Linfield said last week that the shared colour scheme was purely coincidental, but Umbro say the colours were all Linfield's idea and that they won't promote the new jersey of the Danske Bank Premiership uh, champions. You get the impression from the Umbro statement, Richie, that this all was news to them. <laughs> well, we just work with the clubs. They asked for the colours <coughs> and they've been a bit taken aback by this whole yeah. situation. They just said, give us purple and orange, and the yeah. number went, okay, um, and didn't ask any questions. Um, sure, given the amount of clients that they'd have, you'd ask, why would they ask any questions? Yeah. Whatever the club wants, that's what they get. But it's um, an unfortunate coincidence, I think, is how we'd put it. Where are we going next? 
Um, something you touched on upon there, Aston Villa boss Dean Smith says his team will join the protests against racial injustice before their game against Sheffield United, which is the first game back in the Premier League. Players will have, as you mentioned, Black Lives Matter on the back of their shirts while the Premier League restarts on Wednesday. Smith believes it's an important part of the football plays. I'm definitely keen to do it, um, but I, I believe the lads will be keen to do it as well. Um, you know, listen, you can't not see what's happening out in the world and, um, you know, uh, we feel strongly about it and we've got we've got players who are very passionate about it as well and um, they have our full support. US Open then? Yeah, the US Tennis Association is due to confirm that this year's US Open is going ahead as planned. The Grand Slam is due to get underway on August the 31st. This year's tournament will, will be played behind closed doors and with strict medical protocols in place for all players. The traditional warm-up event in Cincinnati is likely to be moved to the National Tennis Centre at Flushing Meadows to provide a warm-up for players. Some aren't so keen, though. Rafa Nadal, Novak Djokovic, Ashley Barty and Simona Halep all expressing doubts about playing, but Serena Williams coach Patrick Muratoglu uh, says that Serena would be keen on playing in Flushing Meadows. OK. Any last story you want to bring us? Yeah, Hearts, they've begun legal action against their relegation from the S uh, Scottish Premiership after clubs failed to back league reconstruction in Scotland. The Tynecastle side, along with Partick Thistle and Stran Rar, have had their demotions confirmed today after only 16 SPFL clubs said they would ex expand or support, pardon me, an expanded uh, Premiership. In a statement, Hearts say they're disappointed but not surprised by the news. While Peaceful may still run at Royal Ascot despite just winning the Irish 1000 Guineas on Saturday, Peaceful, one of 11 horses in the six-day entries list for the Coronation Stakes, which takes place on Saturday. Saturday. However, Joseph O'Brien says it's more than likely that Peaceful won't run in the Group 1 on Saturday next, despite being in that list of entries. OK. Richie McCormick, thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers. Ronan Mullen, we'll talk soon. Thanks for that. Cheers, Joe. Short ad break, we're talking with Professor Brian Hanley and Mick Foley of the Sunday Times next. And how do you feel it came me stealing 